Hey, my name is Ben. Thanks for stopping by. Today I want to go over the three different types of regulating devices that are used to regulate refrigerant into an evaporator where the Freon then expands and does its effective cooling. So there are three main types, as I just mentioned, and right here I have them laid out. So the first one, I think I'll go from most common to least common, at least this is for air conditioning. So different types of systems use different types of regulating devices more or less often. So right here on the far right, we have this tiny little orifice. And this orifice is what regulates the amount of refrigerant that goes into an evaporator coil. Now this is a really old style evaporator coil. The modern ones look more like this. Here, A coil, uh, it's called an A coil because it's in the shape of an A. They also have N style coils, which surprise, surprise, are shaped like an N just to get more coil surface area. But regardless of the shape of the coil, the same thing needs to happen. You have liquid Freon or refrigerant. You're supposed to call it refrigerant. Freon is technically not the right term. But anyway, the refrigerant is coming through a small line leading into the evaporator. And that refrigerant needs to be regulated into that evaporator in some way. And so that's what these three things are. So like we already started to talk about here, the orifice is probably one of the most common ways for a standard efficiency system. It relies on an orifice, which we call a fixed regulating device, because the regulating device itself can't adjust at all. It's totally based on ambient temperatures and pressures for it to work. So that's the first type, an orifice. And that just obviously is a calculated size hole that allows a certain amount of refrigerant through into a particular evaporator. So different orifices for different size systems. So if you have a, a two ton AC or a three ton air conditioner, uh, you're going to have a slightly different size orifice. So that's number one. Uh, number two here is the thermal expansion valve. Now this is a slightly more advanced or actually a lot more advanced way of controlling the refrigerant as it goes into the evaporator. And the benefit of this is that it adjusts and maintains a certain amount of superheat. So when the refrigerant first enters the coil, it enters the coil as a liquid. That liquid then expands inside of the coil. Let's just use the top of this coil for example. The liquid Freon expands into this first tube here and it's going to still have a mixture of liquid and gas until it absorbs enough heat to where all of the liquid is fully evaporated. So let's say that, that happens about here. So there's a mixture of liquid and gas going back and forth. You can imagine it as little droplets of uh, moisture, but it's actually liquid refrigerant. And so as this picks up more heat from the house, eventually it'll boil off all of those, all of that liquid. And then once that happens, the temperature of the gas will increase and that temperature difference is called superheat. Uh, I'll probably make another video covering superheat in depth, but that's the general idea. So this bulb then measures what well, the temperature of the line and you want to have a few degrees of superheat. Uh, generally around 20 degrees is a good idea, but it varies widely a little bit based on equipment type. But you want to have superheat in order to make sure that there's no liquid going back to the compressor. Uh, anyway, uh, this bulb, like I said, will sense that temperature, and if there is not enough superheat, it will close the valve, and if there's too much superheat, it'll open the valve. So it's kind of a, um, it's able to adjust it, and the system is slightly more efficient because of that. So if your system has a thermal expansion valve, it's going to be slightly more efficient as long as it's set properly. Uh, Systems with thermal expansion valves are a little bit more difficult to work on, and a little bit more difficult to check the charge on, uh, but they have pros and cons, obviously, just like everything. Now, this third one is the most exciting one that I want to talk to you about, because this is one of the last capillary type systems that I have seen in an air conditioning application. You see capillary tubes all the time 
that are about this size and that are used in refrigerators and freezers all the time, but they don't use capillary tube type systems in air conditioning anymore. So this giant air conditioner here is approximately three tons and it is using, it was paired with that slab coil up there, and it is using this capillary tube. And the way we can tell, uh, right up here, this is where it was going into the evaporator. So it was expanding through this pipe right here. And if we look closely, we can see that that's just an open tube right there. There's no orifice inside of that. There's also no orifice inside of here. So that's where that was attached. So the liquid freon would be entering right there. And then this was the side coming out of the, uh, out of the, condenser itself or the air conditioner here so this is the liquid line and there's also no sort of regulating device in there therefore the regulating device is this quarter inch copper pipe so the way they made this work is obviously the longer a tube is the more resistance it has and so you can basically mimic the effect of using an orifice by using a particular length of a particular size of copper pipe. So this coil here is a set length. So when the system was installed, there's actually leftover copper pipe that they have to leave coiled up somewhere uh, in the system, somewhere where the line set is running. A lot of times you'll see an extra coil of pipe. That's because they couldn't shorten it. It needed to be that length in order to work properly. <sighs> So those are pretty much the three types. I guess I'd say that this one here, with it being a capillary tube type system, and the orifice, they're both fixed regulating devices, so they're really in the same family. Uh, and then the thermal expansion valve, obviously, is the one that's going to make adjustments. They, ha they also have um, electronic thermal expansion valves, which are a lot more precise, and they can control that superheat a lot closer. Uh, but it's uh, gen generally, or the vast majority of the time, we're working with ones that use uh, a remote bulb, like you see here. This bulb actually has a little charge of gas, or sometimes it's even refrigerant in it. Uh, and as this heats up and cools off, it presses on the power head right here. This here on top, where this disc is, that is the power head. So if it's a higher pressure, because this is hotter, so if this is warmer, it's a higher pressure, which pushes harder on the power head, which then opens the valve. This would be the line coming into the expansion valve. This is the line coming out. Uh, this one is for uh, balancing. I think it's called externally equalized, but don't worry about that for the purposes of this video. This is our liquid freon coming in, and then it um, allows um, that liquid to go into the evaporator. And then there's a little spring inside of here. There's a little spring inside of here that uh, you can actually adjust a little bit if you take this cap off of here. So I'm guessing this is pretty tight on here though. So right here, there's a little um, adjustment uh, screw. And when you adjust these things, you gotta adjust it and give it about 15 minutes in between. It's pretty complicated sort of pretty complicated process of adjusting these things. So I really don't recommend adjusting them unless you know absolutely sure that you need to. Uh, a lot of times if you need to adjust them very much and they were working previously, <coughs> it means that the thermal expansion valve has probably failed. I think I'm going too, in detailed on, too detailed on this. So I think we're gonna call that a wrap. Those are the three primary ways that refrigerant is regulated into an evaporator in a refrigeration circuit. Uh, if you found this to be helpful, hit that thumbs up button, subscribe down below. About 95% of the people who watch my videos are not subscribed, so I'd really appreciate it if you would subscribe. Put your comments down below if you have any questions, and we'll talk to you guys in the next video. I'm supposed to go uh, and uh, run the grill here now. My family is coming over in a little bit. We're making pork chops, so. All right, we'll see you guys later.